Hi there, everybody, and welcome to Talking True, where I interview mystics, near-death experiencers, healers, and people who are waking up to the truth of who they are. And in today's show, I'm really excited because I have a very special guest joining me. Her name is Cara Looney, and she's a Hatha yogi, uh, a, a yoga teacher. She teaches Kundalini and Vasa Flow Yoga, and she's the host of her own YouTube channel, which is titled Cara Looney Yoga. So please make sure and check her out. Please make sure and subscribe. And today we're going to dive into the very juicy topic of when creativity meets crisis or when crisis meets creativity. What did we decide on? <laughs> Chicken or the egg? <laughs> oh, no, <yes. laughs> so, Cara, welcome to Talking True. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. And it was so nice to get a message from you and the invitation to speak, you know, I find uh, YouTube is kind of an in intimidating portal, right? At least it was when I first began with it. I was putting yoga classes on there and and uh, seeing how it is such a beautiful connector, especially when it comes to these types of situations where we have the the complication of awakening consciousness, you know, and how do we move through that? And it is something that can't be done in a vacuum. It needs mm -hmm. to be done in community. And so having all of this access to people who are sharing their awakening experiences and uh, how they move through it is, is really powerful and helpful. So. Yes. Yeah, and it's great. So th that might be a great place to start. Do you want to share your awakening story? Sure. Um, it's, it's really interesting that... Uh, I had a Kundalini awakening, you know, when, when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, you know, I thought I had it all figured out. I had this, you know, growing career in a law firm. And I was, you know, into all of my things as far as shoes and bags and money and apartments and cities and, you know, parties and brunches and all of those things. And um, I was a pretty aggressive athlete. Uh, and it's really interesting how certain trajectories take you down a path that only upon reflection can you see, ah, oh, that's where the genesis of this was. And um, I was uh, doing a lot of a lot of just things that were kind of burning the candle at both ends in my life. And I got these little intuitions that I needed to start practicing yoga and mostly because I was recovering from physical injuries and things like that. But there was this strong, deep, message coming from within and from without that I needed to start practicing yoga. And so I did, and it was just mostly sporty yoga. And then, um, <clears throat> and then I was working on a project uh, for my career at the time, and I was working out in LA. And I decided, well, I need to move out to LA. There's something about LA that's just so warm and comforting, having lived on the East Coast my whole life. And so long story short, I had transferred my career out to LA. And I started practicing yoga more and more and more. And I found Kundalini yoga. And I really didn't know what, a, never heard of a Kundalini awakening. I knew nothing about Kundalini energy. I just found that practicing Kundalini yoga was healing and transformative. And it felt like layers were coming off. And I was really starting to bring, <clears throat> come into a state of, of clarity. But at the time, I was practicing for about a year and I never heard of a Kundalini awakening. And then one day it happened. I had a Kundalini awakening and it was like the most magical, true, real, powerful cosmic experience that I had ever had in my life. And from that moment forward, my life had changed. And for about two weeks after that, that uh, punctuated experience, because my awakening was a, a series of punctuated experiences throughout my life. It wasn't one big thing. And uh, after that first punctuated experience, I had about two weeks that felt like I could only describe as like Christ consciousness. It was, I was able to see beyond death. I was able to see the inner workings of relationships and the microcosm and the macrocosm. And I was blowing through books and poetry and it was just, but I couldn't keep up that vibration. That frequency was otherworldly. And so eventually I came down and I was back in the mundane, but but I had changed and I will never forget that experience and what I learned and adopted in my consciousness as a result of that. And so then that's when the crisis started happening. The things that were important 
were no longer important. The things that were relevant and the people that I felt connected to at one point in time felt alien and, and unfamiliar. And so it was really this forced restructuring that, that took about, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm honest, and it wasn't only circumstantial, it was also uh, physical. Like in, when I was doing a lot of reading about my Kundalini awakening, I read uh, that the pain in the body and the things that go on in the body is, is literally the release of karma. It could be physical karma and all sorts of things, not only from this lifetime, but from previous lifetimes. And so thankfully, those concepts were digestible by me, for me, you know, as a result of my experiences. But it was a good five years that I had to work through all of the dismantling and the clearing and the purification and the pain and the sadness and the grief um, that brought me to a point upon realizing, wow, I think I'm actually moving through this, that I was then able to share what happened to me. And then I was able to serve as a, a helpful uh, resource for people who are in the process of going through it. But only after I moved through something really profound and dismantling and depressing and hard and challenging. And so, you know, the topic of our, our meeting today where creativity meets crisis, like it's this powerful creative energy. It is like the human equivalent of the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. But when the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, it needs to liquefy. It needs mm -hmm. to completely dismantle to be reborn into something new. So it is, it's challenging. It's hard. Yes. And, um, and like, like you, I didn't have anyone to turn to. So books were my, were my teachers. Books were my points of reference. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I love everything you've shared. So I, I'd love to, for the, for the sake of the viewers, I'd love to kind of unpack a little bit what you said about your, you know your punctuation points with respect to your awakening what did that what was that like for the with respect to the first one were you meditating or were you you know just going about your day how did that kind of show up for you in the most uncomfortable way possible <laughs> I was in a uh, a gym you know like a very sporty gym and I was practicing just a vinyasa class and in a gym, a vinyasa class really doesn't often have a lot of spiritual reference or relevance. It's mostly flexibility, strength, and oftentimes like acrobatics, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's a lot more surface and ego-based yoga. And so that was the type of class I was in at the time. And I was laying down in savasana at the end of class and oftentimes in a you know, a, a Hatha class, teacher will come around during Savasana and lay their hands on you. And, you know, they were pressing on my shoulders. And at the moment that that teacher pressed on my shoulders, all this energy just shot up from the base of my spine. And it felt like my body was writhing on the floor, you know, and it felt both instantaneous and that it lasted a lifetime all at the same time, you know, and I was totally transported into another place and I was having this extremely ecstatic cosmic experience. And then it passed and I guess, you know, time is all so relative in those types of experiences, but I'm guessing it was about five minutes because that's how long Savasana usually lasts. Mm -hmm. And as I was coming back to my understanding of reality, people were picking up their stuff and leaving the room. Yeah. And from my awareness of the room around me, nobody knew what I was experiencing. It was completely my own experience. And in my mind at the time, I was like, I was glowing and illuminating and filling the room with light, you know? So I assumed yeah. that it was, it was the rest of the room was experiencing that, but they weren't. Um, and so coming home was an interesting situation. I, I don't remember much about that, but like I said, the days after I was still in that, in that high space. Um, and taking advantage of it to the to the fullest capacity, mm -hmm. but, uh, but eventually yeah. I, I came down. Did you feel that you know when you had this expansion, that the the people in the room were walking inside of you in your mm -hmm. energy field uh, uh, and were part of it? Or was okay. no, I didn't feel that at all. I felt like I had kind of left the planet, like I left my body, and I was in some other dimension in some other realm um yeah. yeah yeah so no i didn't feel that and i've actually never felt that that's interesting to consider 
Um, yeah. Yeah. There have been times though, where I have sensed very strongly that I was able to like read other people's minds during that time, during that, during my punctuated periods, I had so much access to psychic abilities that I was like feeling other people's pain. I was reading other people's minds. I was understanding what they were going through in their inner dialogue. Yes. And that's a lot of energy to manage. Thankfully, it didn't last very long. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know what is really intriguing about what you've shared as well is it's so, so similar to people who have near-death experiences. Mm. And, you know, they leave their bodies and they go to another realm and they, you know, this have this meeting sometimes with Christ or whoever their beloved is yeah. and then come back and are completely transformed by it. And it's really hard to put into words the way the transformation kind of unfolds itself mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. There's, 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 there's certainly in my case, and, and it sounds in your case, that there's absolutely no room for any doubt. You're just, it's just absolutely clear what is happening. And it's almost like a return to what you've always known to be true. And for me, anyway, it was a falling away of seeking the seeking energy because I'd always felt that I was looking for something that, you know, I, I was trying to find it in people or places or events or whatever. And then all of that just kind of falls away. But as you said, you know, it does take time. So I'd love to speak okay. a little bit about, um, <laughs> you know, before we started recording, you and I did speak a little bit about the wealth of information information that's available online now but at the same time you have to be very careful about what you digest because um yet master yogis say that after a kundalini awakening it takes time uh it's like um it's like a clay pot a clay pot has to be baked in the oven and if it's not fully baked then it will just kind of crumble and it's, mm -hmm. it's no good for anything yeah um, and, I, and the work that is involved after a kundalini awakening does take time. So, so the reason I'm saying this is because, you know, if you have a kundalini awakening today, it's really not a good thing to be, you know, pretending to teach others all about it when you haven't really done the inner work. And I know, you know, you and I are kind of on the same page with respect to that. And you did reference the work that needed to be done. So do you, do you just want to kind of outline a little bit about how did you, for example, manage the shadow or the, you know, the dark night of the soul or however that kind of um, unfolded for you? Yeah, sure. Um, the books that I had read were quite helpful. And there are a number of books that I have had listed, um, you know, that I can give examples of that have been helpful to me. Listening to uh, Ramdas lectures were so helpful to me, and he uses an analogy that's different but similar to your clay pot, which he speaks of. When you plant a tree and it's a sapling, you have to surround it by a fence. You have to you have to contain and you have to incubate, right? You have to yes. surround it by a fence because any animal that comes by can kind of trample it. But once that tree grows strong and large, an animal can come up and scratch up against it and is completely un, unaffected. Right. So yes. when we're going through this awakening process, we're so vulnerable, we're so influenced, you know, easily influenced and almost desperate. Right. We're desperate for understanding and clarity. <clears throat> and I think what was key for me is through the reading of the books that I had found is recognizing that one must find a reliance on the, upon themselves. What is expressing yes. itself through you is pure, unadulterated truth. And if you're trying mm -hmm. to get someone else to tell you about how you are supposed to relate to that truth, you're going to run into problems often, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll find a very helpful person who will redirect you back to yourself. But yes. um, so I was hearing that from reading that from a number of different angles. And I'll tell you, if, if I had had my awakening later on, like now, and that I had the wealth of YouTube and social media available to me, it would have been much more distracting for me to actually lean into proper proper guidance. So <clears throat> as much as it's a beautiful thing that a lot of people are waking up and we have a lot of resources, many of these resources are toxic for the awakening process. And so mm -hmm. um, what I found through my various, um, my various resources was this constant redirection back 
to creating a relationship with the divine consciousness that's that's awakening within you. There is a true and caring and loving energy that is moving through you and expressing itself through you and, and purifying you and clearing out the blocks and dismantling things that no longer have purpose and opening up things that have purpose and direction. And so I think it's really important for each person to spend time creating a relationship not only with that energy that's moving itself through them but also the part of yourself that is dying the part of yourself that is no longer relevant or no longer useful and i mm -hmm. found through the practice of yoga and meditation which is ultimately a technology that unifies the limited self with the universal self that was the most powerful thing i could have done for myself workshops mm -hmm. you know all of these different types of things are great but really when i found myself connected to the ancient technology of yoga and meditation which was if you read about it a technology that is designed to help humanity connect to their highest expression of consciousness this is the technology that matches with the awakening process the two are meant to be together so yes. <clears throat> you know yes. um, the only recommendation I could ever give to somebody is find a yoga and meditation practice that resonates with you. Try out different things, you know, work with mantras, work with breath work, work with different technologies that that aid you in the awakening process. And one thing that I find really disturbing these days is <clears throat> the ambition around awakening Kundalini energy. Yeah. Yes. Um, awaken your Kundalini in a week long workshop, you know, yes. Yes. Oh, nothing. Know. First of all, it oh. is a, it's an energy that will not awaken under those, those the, that's, that's such a, that's like a snake oil salesman Yes. <laughs> because it's the energy only awakens when the environment is prime and the environment is only prime in surrender and receptivity, not yes. through ambition, not through striving, not through forcing. Yes, yes, yes. I'm absolutely with you 100%. I mean, I can't tell you the number of people that have sent me messages and said, you know, there's some guy on, on, on Instagram or wherever, or woman or whoever it is, offering a weekend workshop on, you know, how to activate the wake and your kundalini and, and, and balance all your chakras or whatever the thing, you know, the title of the thing is. And, you know, it's, it's a few thousand dollars. And, you know, is it, is it authentic? And I just, you know, <laughs> really and truly, I just say, listen, you know, it's it's a kind of an organic process. And what I would say is look at the lineage of the teacher. You know, is there a lineage behind him or her? You know, find out how long they have, assuming they've had a, an awakening themselves, you know, how long has that been in effect? Um, and don't just sign up for something because of the brevity of it, you know, because the <laughs> Kundalini awakening <laughs> isn't a 48 hour process. It really isn't. But but people just get sucked into that hole. They want the, they want the speed of it, yeah. you know. Immediate gratification. And, yeah. you know, be careful what you wish for, because in a Kundalini awakening, although the most beautiful thing that has ever happened to me and the biggest blessing in my life was also the most challenging experience I've ever, ever faced. Mm -hmm. I mean, it yeah. really requires you to step into a whole different space of, of sovereignty. Yes. Yes. You know? You'll be, ch you'll be challenged. Um, uh, you know, and like you were referencing um, earlier when you were describing, you know, your, the, what happened to you. I went through periods, long periods where I had physical discomfort and ailments and illnesses. And I knew that it linked to this awakening. It was a sort of a purification process. Yeah. But I would often get sick, often with stomach issues, you know, and things that felt like flu. Um, and then I'd have periods where there was a lot of emotional s sort of releasing and psychological challenges and, and all of that. So you really do have to be ready for it. It's not it's not for the faint of heart, you know. <laughs> not at all. Um, I had I mean, a lot of um, nervous system related issues. Um, just tons of pain and restriction in my body. And I would get a massage and try it. And they'd be like, you are so tight. And the second it would loosen up, it would just tighten right back up. And as I became a Vedic astrologer, I recognized the placements in my natal chart that made certain karmic uh, ailments 
more likely than others. Like where you say yours were stomach related, mine was nervous system related and muscular and physical. Mm -hmm. And so being educated in a lineage of Vedic astrology, I started the whole understanding because so much of understanding Vedic astrology is about the awakening process and, and developing a spiritual sadhana and um, the awakening of your consciousness over various lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. So the Kundalini awakening and using Vedic astrology as a tool are very closely related to one another. And so upon looking at charts of people who are going through awakenings, I was able to see kind of some of the challenges that they might start you know, um, experiencing based on placements. Yes, yes. Or the fact that they even have an awakening period. Oh, there's your awakening, right? The likelihood is in your eighth house or your sixth house or... Yes, yeah. yeah. And and actually that's really helpful to, to be given that information if you're going through an awakening and you're struggle, struggling with some of the physical symptoms because you can't necessarily speak to just about anybody, even, even in a yoga community, you know, you can't necessarily speak to people about um, what's happening. They, um, you know, the yogic terminology for these things is the, is kriyas, right? The kriyas, uh, you have these kriyas relating to the awakening, which is like the purification and the releasing of these mm -hmm. knots, which could yeah. be physical, emotional, or psychological. And it can be it can be really challenging if if you really don't know what it's about, especially if it keeps happening i mean thankfully i used to have lucid dreams with these master yogis and they would kind of press points or sometimes mm. i'd vomit you know and and i knew that it was all, all related to the kundalini awakening but um you know if you don't really understand much about yoga uh it can be it can be really that's hard. true that's true i mean i was lucky to be marrying yoga and my awakening at the same time but if you're having an awakening and you have no connection to yoga or meditation or anything like that and you're just still left working with the tools that exist in the general mainstream society that adds a whole other level of suffering i think yes because yoga and meditation embedded deeply within it has the answers that you're looking for the understanding of the chakras the understanding of energy the understanding of karma and purification and all of these things that that go hand in hand um yes. you know i it was something you said uh made me think back you were talking about you know um going to different resources and i find it interesting that people tout themselves as experts writing about kundalini yoga or even supporting people or i'm sorry kundalini awakening and tout themselves as experts and even guide people through kundalini awakenings and they never have had one themselves yes. they've studied yes. on it yes and i'll tell you nothing is more impactful than the direct experience mm -hmm. so I, I urge a lot of people if you're watching this if the people that you're seeking assistance from make certain that they've at least worked with the awakening energy within themselves because you know, there's a lot of people who write articles of expertise on this and they've never, and you can tell based on yes. as a person who's had an awakening, I can tell that they didn't based yes. on what they're saying. You know what yes. I mean? Yeah, me too. I can tell within five seconds or, or, or less <laughs> whether there's, I, you can feel it. You can feel the place from which these words are coming from, um, especially with respect to the detailing of it, and you can t you can really tell also when somebody's just speaking from secondhand knowledge rather than from their own direct experience. So I'm so glad you brought that up because there is a lot of an awful lot of that online now, where people are selling programs and courses and books and whatever it is, and it's clear they just have not had um, had an awakening. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, I'd love to have a conversation about the creative creativity meets crisis part and how you went from being in, in law, you said you were in law at one point, yeah. um, to where you are today, because that's, <laughs> I mean, that's just such a huge leap, right? A hundred percent. But because that energy was so powerful within the awakening process, that was one of the things that was clear that it needed to to be let go in my life. You know, I would go over the, after my awakening process, I would do a lot of spiritual work over the weekends, meditating, breath work, mantra workshops, you know, all of those things that would really elevate me into that space to allow myself to connect to the energy that was moving through me. 
And then Monday, I would spend an hour in traffic driving into downtown LA to go to a law firm. And the vibration of that environment and the level of consciousness, you know, it was conflict rich, it's greed based, all of those things. And it just, it was so depleting and so shrinking of everything that I had done over the weekend. So it was creating this this bipolar kind of energy, yes. you know, where I was ex exalted over the weekends. And then on the weekdays, mm -hmm. I was suffering very profoundly. And so I realized I needed to leave that job. But all of the practicalities, you know, time off, paid time off, vacation time, 401k, all of the things that keep you stuck in the kind of golden handcuffs of a corporate environment. Mm -hmm. But to me, I was I was experiencing something cosmic, and that was becoming more real than anything within the mundane and any of the safe playing strategies that were, you know, always in, relevant to me prior to that time. And so mm -hmm. I knew very strongly that I needed to leave that environment. And so, <clears throat> you know, it wasn't I didn't do it perfectly. It was I was trying to kind of keep one foot in the world of law and one foot in the world of yoga. And I was separating myself and not really fully leaping into what my higher self was telling me I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been a little bit risk averse, I guess, if you would say, I would, I, if I've taken risks, they've been calculated risks in my life. So to just jump into something, regardless of what was expressing itself through me, I knew I needed to pay my bills and do all of these things. and. Um, so it took a little while. I was going between two worlds. And then finally, once I decided neither one of these are working, I have to leave one, which one am I going to leave? It was obvious. Mm -hmm. And then I threw all of my eggs into the basket of wanting to just be of service to people teaching yoga and meditation because it has changed my life so profoundly. And once I made that leap, that creative leap of trust in not only the messages that were coming in through me, but trusting that I was cared for in a larger way, cosmically. Yes. Um, as a side note, I was raised Catholic. So there was always the fear of God, the fear of God's punishment. There mm -hmm. wasn't much embrace about the love of God unless you were doing all the right things. You know what I mean? So it was yes. kind of a tyrannical parent, God. And what was expressing itself for me through yoga and meditation and the Kundalini Awakening was this much more benevolent and supportive and understanding God. And so uh, once I took that leap and trusted, all of a sudden, all these clients and all these opportunities, it was like a net was there for me. Mm -hmm. And I had all these different uh, corporate clients make themselves available to me. And that's how I started to make a living. So, you know, it, it taught me, a, it taught me a lesson that I'd never actually had the courage to try out before. But because of this powerful experience, because of this new understanding of my place in the universe that I had never experienced before, I was a little bit more willing to jump into, what if, what if it could work? What if it's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and all I have to do is trust? Mm -hmm. And once I did that, you know, the world started to open up for me. And I would have never guessed it would have transitioned into all the things that it has. And it's had its ups and downs, certainly. Like during COVID, all of my work shifted. I wasn't able to go into corporations and teach yoga, but then all of a sudden something else came through. And and I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing based on the experiences that I've had, the gift that I've been given with Kundalini Awakening. And as a result, that energy is supporting me and being of service. And so I'm able to be supported in the work that I'm choosing to do because it is yogically minded. Um, yes. If you think about all the yamas and the niyamas and, and all of the things that when you are trying to be supportive to the universal flow, right? I'm, I'm doing my best to be non-harming. I'm doing my best to be collectively beneficial. And in doing that, I feel like I've been then supported. You know? Yes, yes, yeah. And the other thing is, um, I'm sure you're the same as, as I am in terms of when a prompt lands in you to do something that might be outside of your comfort zone, you are far more likely to lean into it and to follow where it's pointing to than, you know, prior to the Kundalini awakening. I mean, I, I just absolutely trust the place from which a prompt arises or an intuitive you know, message lands. 
um, yeah. on eight. And to- I'd like to add to that actually, because the difference yeah. between I would always get those prompts, but I wanted a guarantee back then. I wanted an understanding of where that would end, what the end result would be of that. And then after the Kundalini awakening, it created so much more humility in my consciousness to say, "It's in your hands." Yes. Of energy, it's really in your hands. All I have to do is follow your prompts, and um, yes, I'll be taken care of. Yeah, and you know, even if you don't know what you're doing, somehow something or someone will show up to help you along the way, right? Which, which yeah. is always the way it works. Um, and it's really quite amazing. I mean, I always say, you know, the awakened Shakti is supremely intelligent and it will figure it out. You know, you don't have to, I don't have to as a small I have to. Mm-hmm kind of like try and orchestrate or manage anything because it's just beyond my control in every every single way and, and it's better than us yeah it? yeah and it's just lovely to be able to just let go and to dive into the ocean of that you know and flow with that rather than feeling like you need these kind you need this proof or there's someone there to kind of um you know, help you or something or show you that you're going to be okay. You know, I just, I always just say yes and go for it. Obviously it has to feel right. You know, if it, if it doesn't feel right, then it's a different thing, but right. um, you know, it's, it's, it's really incredible what happens, at, at, you know, after a Kundalini awakening, because I'm absolutely certain you would never have dreamed in a million years that you'd be teaching um, Kundalini yoga and doing everything you're doing. Not at all. But upon looking at my chart and having, you know, understanding of astrology, I see that it was actually my destiny. You know, if you were to show me my Vedic astrology chart when I was working in law and it tells me, well, you have a Parivartana between your sixth house and your ninth house, and you actually have some really strong placements for being an astrologer and a spiritual teacher and guiding people through crisis, I would have been like, no way, my career is in law. That, that's so wrong. <laughs> but then, but that's the chart knew what my, you know, what my unfolding destiny was way more than I ever did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yes, yes. So you offer, you offer Vedic readings for people as well as teaching ha- um, Kundalini yoga. Yes, yeah. And I think that's really helpful, especially when people are coming. I mean, I, I've been getting people coming to me going through the early stages of a Kundalini awakening. And it's such a desperate place. I've been there. And they want, you know, first of all, they want you to tell, oftentimes tell you how to get back to where my life was. How do I get back to where I was? Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, that's not going to happen. And no. you don't want it to happen. If you could really step away, this is a this is a beautiful invitation and a privilege that's been given to you in this particular lifetime that is that is very unique it's a blessing um so helping people see that helping people see that actually your old life is something that you know you'll see soon enough was needed to go and something bigger and more powerful is available to you into the into the future as you lean into this energy um, and so helping people find faith in this creative energy moving through them, because oftentimes it feels more like a crisis than a, the creative opportunity. And so the use of yoga and meditation is helpful, but also the use of Vedic astrology is helpful because it gives them a more holistic understanding of their past, their present, and their future, and laying it out in a way that this is your curriculum, this is your assignment, this is not a mistake. All the challenges and hardships that you've gone through are not a mistake. They're part of your assignment. And mm-hmm. part of your assignment also is going through a Kundalini awakening. And maybe it's going to be a more challenging Kundalini awakening. Maybe it's going to be one that you slide right through and then, you know, but the, the Vedic astrology serves as a very useful tool, not only for people going through Kundalini awakening, but anyone who's kind of curious of understanding um, their yeah. dharma and their deeper their deeper uh, kind of purpose for being here. I guess you can say it gives a little bit more holistic clarity. Yes, yeah, it's it's kind of a bit like a roadmap in a way as well, right? So that you can see oh yeah, this kind of, this is where I've been and that all makes sense. And this is where I am now and this is where I'm going. So, yeah. so that could be really helpful, I think. So, so how does that work? Can we just, I think this might be very helpful for viewers. So let's say I would like to get a Vedic reading from you. How, how does that work? I would contact you and I give you what kind of information? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, I'd love to gift you one because, you know, just connecting here with you, I'd love to, to give you a reading and see what your thoughts are on it. Um, so a person would reach out to me and I would ask them for their date of birth, their um, city of birth and their time of birth. And the time of birth is very important because your rising sign and all of your placements can change based on a matter of seconds. So having a very accurate birth time is really important to getting the most accurate reading. Um, and the interesting thing is the difference between Western astrology and Vedic astrology. Western astrology doesn't follow the, the proper or the, the proper astronomy or the proper ecliptic of the sun. It generalizes the movement of the sun. So it's not as accurate in prediction as Vedic astrology. Um, <clears throat> Western astrology is really helpful for, I'd say, like people who want to understand the astrology of um, a country, right? Over hundreds and hundreds of years, this country has been in existence. What is the astrology of the politics or the, the, the dynamic of this particular country? When you're looking over large expanses of time, Western astrology is helpful because it gets you out of the weeds. But when you're working with a person whose lifetime is probably max 100 years, Getting into the weeds is very important because you want to understand the very specific dynamics of the karmic playouts. And that's yeah. when using Vedic astrology is, is really helpful. Nice. That's very exciting. So, I mean, I'll have, um, I'll have all that information in the show notes so that people can connect with you and, and find out more. But, um, you know, I think that's really a fantastic tool so to speak, or gift, you know, to be able to help you navigate your way through. So so what else have you got going on? Do you do online classes and um, workshops and trainings and things like that? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I teach uh, live stream classes. I teach two, two Vinyasa Hatha Flow classes uh, live stream twice a week. And I teach two live stream Kundalini classes uh, weekly. And we have a great community of yogis that come together. We practice together. And then I have, you know, a video library of all those classes. And a lot of these people that practice together, we're part of a spiritual community. So we're talking about our life changes and things that are happening. People's, you know, parents are, you know, moving into later stages of life or people moving into jobs or different shifts. Um, so there's a connected to community of people who we've been learning and getting to know each other over a course of years. So I do those live stream classes and I also do what are called 40 day meditation journeys. Um, my next one's coming up starting Wednesday the 10th. So it'll be coming up just next week. Um, and every 40 days, we basically work on a new meditation technique. We meet together live stream twice a week and all the video recordings are available. And you know, this, this coming journey, we're working uh, 40 days of gratitude. So we do gratitude journaling. We'll be working with the Savitur Gaitri mantra. So it's a very mantra focused community. Um, I found a lot of benefit through mantra as a result of my awakening, the vibrational frequency, all of those things with sacred mantras. Yes. Really powerful to keep your mind directed toward creativity. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And I do um, sound healing training. Um, I, I also teach uh, different corporations. I teach uh, yoga and meditation at Montana State University. Um, and, uh, and I do my Vedic astrology and I'll do coaching with people on uh, people who are going through Kundalini awakenings. So I do a little bit of coaching there, helping people kind of move through that really difficult part. And I think the key to what it is that I do with coaching here is to remind them and help them stay focused in the direction that this is a loving, benevolent energy. Yes. And if things are leaving your life, it's because they're meant to and they're supposed to. And really learning how to become more trusting in yourself, more sovereign, more connected to your inner knowing, as opposed to seeking outward for rescue. You know? Yes, yes, yeah. I love that. More sovereign, you know, it's fantastic. Because that does happen, I think, too. You know, where even after people have had an awakening, there can still be this drive to keep looking for, to other people for answers rather than trusting your own innate knowing. So um, I love what you're doing. It just sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you. So, yeah, really great. And thank you for sharing all of that. And again, all of that will be in the show notes if people want to um, to reach out and connect with you. Um, and we're kind of coming to the end of uh, our time together. But before we close off, um, do you want to let people know where they can find you and how to reach out and all of those things? Sure. And one thing I'd like to also say is, you know, just based on what you were saying, we we're talking about sovereignty. You know, I think in so many ways, 
um, a lot of the mental health crisis that are going on with people who are awakening is this lack of self-reliance and seeking outside of yourself. And if you're seeking outside of yourself towards someone who doesn't understand what you're going through or has never had an awakening, yes. it can really lead you down a very confused and fragmented place, you know, road um, in a way that, you know, I think um, can be very destructive. So mm -hmm. I really caution people uh, when it comes to the awakening process is really turn within and, and turn, learn how to trust the, the, the information that's making itself known to you through you. Because if you constantly seek outside of yourself, you're going to lose connection with what's trying to wake up inside of you. And, you know, it can, it can, um, it can put to a halt or deaden or, you know, kind of take something in the wrong direction with this energy. And, um, you know, yes. I don't even, I don't even know what that could, that could end up being like, but I just, I really encourage people to, to trust their own knowing, because that was the thing that, helped me through constantly is trust myself, learn how to rely on myself, the accountability, the trust. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's really important for me to say that. Um, and where people can find me is uh, on my website, caralooney.com. And from there, you'll see my live stream classes, you know, uh, you could drop in, you could join the monthly membership. Um, there is uh, my 40 day meditation journeys under the courses and registration section, Vedic astrology, coaching, all of that is there on my website. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate you connecting with me and reaching out. It's, it means a lot to maintain some sort of a cohesiveness with other people in the awakening community. Um, because the more that we can reinforce what we know to be true and create that safe haven for people to go to when they're going through something that we know that we're offering something that, that they can trust and rely upon, you know? Yes. Yes. It has great value and it's authentic. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's key right there. Yeah. So Cara, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been absolutely wonderful and uh, we certainly shared a lot and I hope this has been, it will be helpful to, to viewers. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As always, if you feel that this content has value, let other people know. And if you haven't already subscribed, you know what to do. So thanks once again, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.